Oh, hi. I'm Chris Kohler, editor of Game Life, and tonight we're here at the Wired store in New York City for the grand opening where I'm going to be interviewing Alex Rogopoulos, the CEO of Harmonix, the makers of Rock Band. I had been playing games my whole life, and even when I was dabbling in programming, writing some adventure games and stuff when I was younger, but when we started the company, we weren't thinking about that really at all. We thought of ourselves when we started it, and to this day, even though we're making games, we still think of ourselves as a music company, uh, not a game company. Um, and that was especially true in the early years, because for the first four years or so of our existence, we weren't making games. We were just making these kind of interactive music creative, expressive systems, uh, doing some PC CD-ROM stuff, a product called the Axe, which was a joystick music creation program, and uh, some theme park exhibits and things like that. And it was all just about freeform music making and not about gameplay at all. In the late 90s, the first music games started to appear in Japan, games like Parappa uh, or Beat Mania, Dance Dance Revolution. And at first, I'm kind of embarrassed to say that at the very beginning, we kind of looked down our nose at those games because the, music, the form of musical interaction, the rhythm action gameplay that was being pioneered in those games, it was not very sophisticated as a form of musical interaction. It seemed really simplistic compared to what we were doing. And again, we had this naive sense that what we were doing was better than that because it was more complex or more rich in some way. And um, we had that viewpoint until we actually played the games. And then we were really struck by how fun they were. And more importantly, we were struck by how um, there was, in these games, they're games, so there's, there are these objective criteria for success and failure. There are goals. You, can, you win them. There's something very specific you're striving for. And what really struck us about that was, um, one, most people need that. They don't just want freeform creative play. Most people, I'm talking. I mean, this is, of course, not true for everyone, but for most people, creative work is actually work. It can be very rewarding work, um, but it's work, and it's, it's often not entertain, entertainment. And it's critical for stickiness um, and uh, the desire to keep doing something again and again. That's, I mean, how we design games as game designers, is creating those, that hierarchy of goals and achievement as you work your way through very short-term small goals to large macro goals over the course of a game. And it had that hierarchy of goals that we hadn't really appreciated in our former work. And the final thing we realized, I think, was that rhythm action gameplay wasn't a trivial form of musical interaction. We had been focused before that on musical creativity um, and not on musical performance per se, but that rhythm action was a, a kind of simulation of music performance that was legitimate, that felt musical uh, when we were playing it. And so there was a huge you know, light bulb moment for us in the late 90s where we realized that we had been on the wrong track for four years, that, music, that merging music making and gameplay were how we were going to accomplish what we wanted to accomplish, but on a much bigger scale. And so at that point, we just redirected the company and decided to try to bring music gameplay to the Western markets where there was no success at that point, and to try to advance the genre to the next level. And it was at that point that we started prototyping the, our first music game, which eventually went on to become Frequency, which Sony published. It's interesting. We think about these games uh, as you know, music that you put into these games are serving one of two purposes. One is, like, if someone's playing one of these games and, and they're playing a song in the game that they already know and they already love, they're just experiencing it in a new way, connecting to the music on a deeper level. It's, already, it's music that they already know and love, and they're sort of they're, they're resonating with that familiarity of the music through the gameplay. And it's very different from a second function that these games play, which is the music discovery aspect of them which is that uh, you, when you play new music that you, uh, you know, play in the game music that you don't already know, it's actually harder to play at first because your memory and your familiarity with the song guides you through the gameplay. And when you're playing these games, you're playing with your ear as much as you're playing with your eye. I think for us, when we were originally composing the soundtrack, we weren't thinking so much about the music discovery aspect of it. We were thinking about trying to compile, compile a killer rock soundtrack that would be as familiar to as many people as possible. And then, of course, we threw a few kind of hidden gems on there. Like, I remember with, there was a Blue Oyster Cult track on there. And, you know, the Blue Oyster Cult track that everybody, you know, that is most famous in popular culture is, is Reaper. Right. Um, but there is a much better 
uh, Blue Oyster Cult track, Godzilla, which mm -hmm. um, actually at the protest of our publisher at the time, we insisted go in instead, and um, we thought it was just a much better song. And one of the thing, early things we noticed was like a lot of our fans flipping out about that song because they knew the band, they had heard of the band, but they had never experienced that song, and they were having a blast playing it. And then I, we started getting anecdotal information about like, you know, a 40-year-old dad who was, who was playing the game and his, he was totally psyched because his, you know, 12-year-old daughter had been playing with him and now she was like, she knew Deep Purple lyrics by heart. And we really started to get tuned into this fact that actually the discovery aspect of music games was at least as important uh, as, as the former aspect because... Um, Experiencing new, mu new music that you haven't heard before in this form for the first time, it's an incredibly impactful way to experience that music. And it really gets under your skin and gets inside of you and gets internalized in a way that it never would under normal circumstances if you just hear it on the radio or something like that. The, the aesthetic design um, and the whole uh, kind of framing of Guitar Hero was more cartoony, mm -hmm. kind of meat-headed metal flavor. And uh, when we started developing Rock Band, we wanted to take it in a very new direction aesthetically and in terms of the sensibility of the game. We wanted it to feel more authentic, more like real music making as opposed to a, a caricature of it. Um, we wanted it to have broader, more mainstream appeal beyond just you know, metal and harder, and class, harder classic rock. And um, so we started going after original masters rather than covers. We had been working with cover recordings that we had produced in a studio earlier, but we really felt for the authenticity's sake, it had to be master recordings. Um, and then we also um, started uh, collect, you know, compiling soundtracks that were a much broader and more diverse mix of music. And, and we felt at the time, I remember thinking that it was pretty risky because normally when you're thinking about product design and product marketing, it's all about focus and really understanding a specific consumer and, and designing around that specific consumer in mind. And in this case, there was a conscious decision, a conscious decision to go broad. And the reason that that's risky is because, you know, with, with like the early Guitar Hero game, you knew if you had like a metal fan or a classic rock fan or whatever, that the vast majority of the music on that soundtrack was going to be familiar to that person and was going to appeal to them and draw them in. And with rock bands, the diversity meant that it was a very different strategy towards how we were going to be selling the game to the market because probably any particular consumer, because of the diversity, would recognize 12 uh, or 15 of the 50 songs on the soundtrack instead of most of them. And they would be, have to be taking a leap of faith about a lot of the other music on the soundtrack. And then so you'd have this, the market would be broken into these pockets of people who, for whom 15 to 20 of the songs on the soundtrack would be familiar, but not all of them. But the reason that we felt that that was okay was because of the, the, the collaborative party nature of the game, that there would be a pollinating effect of, this was, a, this was a game about four people or more coming to play music together, or more if you consider the crowd of people in a room at a party, that... They would be selecting music, like each individual would be, would be selecting music that they knew and were familiar with, but they would be playing with, with others and kind of pollinating that music to other people. And this was a, a, a bet that we took in, in the soundtrack conception and design, but it, it really, we feel, it felt it paid off because when, then, when Rock Band then went on and exploded, then that, you know, those, the anecdotes broadened as well that, you know, I mentioned earlier, you'd have the like, middle-aged dad totally psyched that he had successfully indoctrinated his, you know, his 13-year-old daughter with Deep Purple, mm -hmm. it, it went the other way as well. You'd have these teenage girls totally psyched that they had like, gotten their dad hooked on the yeah, yeah, yeahs. And that flow of music discovery, we found, was, was working in both directions, which was an incredibly gratifying realization for us. Before Guitar Hero and Rock Band and all of this happened, the, it was a pretty strained relationship, actually, between the record companies and the game publishers because, generally speaking, the game publishers' point of view was that they were like MTV, meaning a, an, an excellent promotional opportunity for the record companies. So you would have dialogues between the uh, game publishers and the record companies where the game publishers would say, look, give us these famous tracks by big bands of yours for free to stick in our games, and it's worth it for you because millions of people are going to play our games, they're going to get to know the music, and then they'll go buy it. You know, the game publishers were positioning themselves as MTV or the radio as a promotional platform, which, which was fine as far as it went, um, but it wasn't a direct business opportunity for the record companies. Um, whereas when uh, music games started exploding, 
Um, and in particular, when uh, we started working on Rock Band, um, bec again, because of how we viewed it as a music platform and an expansion of, of music entertainment, we had a, a very clear philosophy about how we wanted to work with the music publishers and the record labels uh, and the recording artists, which was to deal them in a, in a substantial financial way in, in what we were doing. And that really changed the tenor of the relationship between game companies and uh, in the record industry because for the first time they were being invited in as material financial partners in the endeavor and I think that's what has led to the you know the, the stampede of content onto the rock band platform over the last year or so. The interesting thing is that as at the time as the original Guitar Hero was starting to snowball into a kind of phenomenon there was obviously a, a lot of the in publishers in the industry, were t the game publishers, were taking notice. And of course, Activision uh, bought Red Octane. Um, and there were a number of uh, game publishers who were interested in acquiring Harmonix at the time as well. But we had been talking to MTV for years. And ultimately, the reason that it was at the fit, you know, Harmonix becoming part of MTV made so much more sense to me than us becoming part of a game publisher was because, you know, as I said early on, we had always and have always thought of ourselves as a music company first and a game company second. And the, re the really uh, exciting aspect of the MTV relationship was that they seemed to get that. You know, uh, uh, through, uh, through all levels of MTV, um, there was enthusiasm about what we were doing as a new dimension of music or a new frontier in music. And that has really uh, borne itself out in practice as uh, MTV has stepped in and been enormously helpful in forging new relationships with major rec recording artists and, and record companies. And so we, we're thrilled with how that's played out. There are several different axes along which you're going to see music games advance over the coming years. Um, one is just on the content axis, which is that even though there are you know, nearly 500 songs playable on the rock band platform, et cetera, that's huge by you know, historical standards in the music game category. But if you think about the entire universe of amazing music that's out there, only the tiniest sliver of it is available for play in interactive form right now. And so certainly uh, Harmonix has and will continue to, you know, with increasingly aggressively, just try to explode out the portion of the content of great music that's out there that is playable in some kind of interactive form. The word revolution is, is batted around very cavalierly, but I do feel like when rhythm action gameplay took hold in Japan in the late 90s, that was a gameplay revolution, that there was a fundamental, there was a new, a new cat, you know, there had essentially been no category around this form of gameplay, and new gameplay is not invented all that often. Mm -hmm. For Since then, since the late 90s, around that time, 97 through now, there have been uh, evolutionary steps in the music game category, some of them significant, and there's been a steady march forward, and you know, Harmonix has certainly been trying to do what it can to, uh, to you know, push, push that mm -hmm. frontier forward in evolving uh, and refining and experimenting around the fringes with rhythm action gameplay, but at its core, the mechanic is still the same. Mm -hmm. So you say you want a revolution, but uh, I just wanted to talk, of course, uh, about the fact that Harmonix will be doing a Beatles game next year. Ah, uh, yes. Please tell us uh, everything about it. <laughs> well, as you know, Chris, there's very little I can say about it. Uh, I thought this now. was the unveiling. No, not My just yet. My God. I was tricked. Um, well, but the story behind the, you know, the, the, the inception of the game is, is, is kind of interesting. Um, the, uh, my boss and the, the president of the music group at, at MTV is uh, Van Toffler. And it turns out he uh, knows the Harrison family. And it was um, winter of, wow, nearly two years ago that uh, Van called me. And he had, he had been on vacation in the Caribbean somewhere, I think, and had just had dinner with the Harrisons. And it turned out that Danny was a, you know, a huge fan of Harmonix Games. That was nice to hear. And that, uh, and that he wanted to meet. And uh, so uh, I met with Danny, and we got to, yeah, you know, we were having fun and brainstorming. And it occurred to me that, wait a minute, this thing that I've always assumed would be impossible maybe isn't actually impossible right now. Like, maybe it's actually time that we could make an interactive version of this incredible music. And so we started talking about it, and, and it started gaining momentum. And, we, and very early on, we started getting the actual, you know, Livia and Yoko and Ringo and Paul involved in thinking about this and started working on early prototypes. And it just started taking on a life of its own and gaining momentum. And after you know, a year and a half or more of 
kind of nudging that ball forward very delicately, it, the stars all aligned and it finally came together. And uh, I, I got to tell you, it's really, it's really a dream project for me. I literally have been dreaming of an opportunity to work with this material since I was a child. So um, yeah, boy, we can't wait to unveil this thing next year.